ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. It's really hard to look back on it now and go, what on earth happened? They say it's about telling the truth. Harry and Meghan's bombshell Netflix series released today claims to share the other side of their high-profile love story. Everything changed. No one sees what's happening behind the closed doors. I had to do everything I could to protect my family. The couple have split opinion among the public, not just in the UK, but around the world. However, they believe this series will lay out the challenges they faced that led them to their decision to leave the royal family. But how will this series impact their reputation? Will it harm the royal family? And could we see a significant fallout from this series? When the stakes are this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? Joining me now is royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. So, Richard, the series is out today. Before it came out, though, the trailer alone got quite a lot of negative backlash. Uh, do you think people will be happier when they watch the series? I think that I'm very conscious that I've seen only three hours out of six. And the second trailer appeared to be, it was only a minute long, but I mean, it seemed to me to be a bit of, what was a part of a thriller where Harry was talking about dirty tricks and they were talking about planted stories and so forth. And it could have been a full-scale attack on the royal family as Oprah was. Now, that hasn't materialised in the first three hours of it. But remember what they've been looking at, essentially, their childhoods, careers, obviously their romance. And I mean, fans will love the intimate texts and videos shared and all of that, the photographs and so forth. So far as the monarchy is concerned, I don't think there was a great deal in it that would cause problems. There were certainly no attacks or criticism of individuals in any way that would be, I think, disturbing. Uh, the, uh, the accusations of unconscious bias and links to the slave trade, I mean... Some of that is a matter of history, but there's no question that it was very much the Sussexes, always unpredictable, controlling the narrative. And I have to say that the fact I was concerned originally about this, and most particularly thinking it might be a far, far tougher take on the royal family, one has to bear in mind that you've got the six-hour docuseries airing now, and Harry's memoir Spare air airing in another uh, month. It still could be explosive. Based on the first three hours, the first three episodes of this series, do you sympathise at all with Harry and Meghan? Well, I certainly feel sympathy for the uh, ferocity of the it's assault on any form of liberty that you have when the world's press are interested in you uh, or fascinated by you. We're the world's most high-profile monarchy, and that's reflected in the interest, and the interest is extreme. But having said that, I had thought that Meghan, with her background as an actress and the fact that she had some ex red carpet experience, was ideally placed with Harry to take the monarchy as their chief modernizers and also to having, particularly given her background, having very special links with the Commonwealth. This, of course, did not occur and subsequently it has been disastrous. Oprah was a, an interview where there were many aspects of it that were unsatisfactory. Oprah didn't probe. There was their truth, not necessarily the truth. But the facts were a lot of young people bought it and it did a lot of damage. I was concerned that this might, and it still might, because we haven't seen the second part, but the primary attraction, I mean, there's no doubt Harry and Meghan have got very good chemistry together and fans will love some of the shared comments and texts and photographs and that side of it. The royal family never appeared in a particularly favourable light, but it didn't appear that much and not in any way that would really disturb or cause uh, the palace to um, have serious problems with it. The series is sort of prefaced with uh, the statement at the start, isn't it, saying that the royal family did not want to comment on footage that appeared in the series. Do you think we could see a response, a statement from the royal family? 
Firstly, I think the answer to that is no. Pretty well whatever appears in the second section. They can't. This is the great disadvantage of having a hugely high profile, which is wonderful when things go well. When things don't go well, it's a real problem. The Queen had her authority backing a statement after Oprah that some recollections may vary. King Charles has only been in the uh, the throne for three months. He hasn't even been crowned as yet. Uh, there's no question that it's an awkward time for him. And I think that no royal statement could go point by point against points they if there were things they disliked. You simply couldn't do that. You can't take the dukedom of Sussexes away except by an act of parliament, and Harry would remain a prince. So uh, the only way of handling material that the palace finds absolutely beyond the pale is simply not to invite the Sussexes to the coronation and casual ties with them. There isn't a halfway house some form of statement that would mean anything much. Let's take a break now. In part two, we take a look at the series itself and how the public might react with Evening Standards Insider Editor Susanna Ramsdale. You'll say, see, this is what they had to go through. This is what was going on. No wonder they were miserable and had to leave. Joining me now is the Evening Standards Insider Editor Susanna Ramsdale. So, Susanna, to kick off with... Can you just give us a rundown of some of the bombshells or big reveals that have been announced in the series so far? Well, I don't know if we would go to say there were too many big bombshells. It was all very interesting. It all provided a very intimate look at what's been going on. But I think compared to what we heard in the Oprah um, interview last summer, there wasn't anything too major. I mean... There was a couple of potentially low blows at William and Kate. At one point, Harry talks about um, how within his family, there's a temptation or an urge to marry someone who would fit the mould as opposed to someone who perhaps you're destined to be with. Um, So there's a lot of speculation um, about who he's talking about. Um, And then also, you know, a little bit about Meghan talking about um, Kate and William and how she was surprised how formal they are. Um, how she kind of expected in front of the cameras, their public facing roles, they're very formal and stiff upper lipped. Um, But she gives quite an amusing anecdote about the first time they came round for dinner and Megan answers the door, bare feet, with ripped jeans on um, and goes to give them a big hug and it didn't go down too well. Um, And so she was very surprised about how formal they were behind closed doors. You know, they also hint at more to come addressing the race issue. Harry at one point says that the royal family has a huge level of unconscious bias. But then in a way, he sort of backtracks a little bit and says, but it's no one's fault and everyone needs to keep learning. So so there were some interesting things there. How would you say Harry and Meghan come across in the series so far, at least? They come across very well, I think. Harry comes across as the Harry that we've come to know, you know, all these years. There's definitely a sense that the first episode of this volume one, as they're calling it, was geared up for an international audience. There's a lot of kind of explanation about how the royal family works, its its place in the world and kind of the protocol that goes on behind the scenes. And a lot about Harry's upbringing and sort of him talking about how he sees it as the press intrusion that he witnessed growing up, how his mother was treated you know, how she suffered within the royal family, um, you know, and at the hands of the media, as he says. So he comes across quite calm, but, you know, he's clearly a hurt, kind of bruised individual. I felt we saw a little bit less of Meghan. She comes across as the Meghan that I think we know, very confident. She seems quite excited to be able to speak finally and, and, you know, let us know her side of things. They seem very much in love and very much in love with the idea of them being in love. You know, they... This part, volume one, was very much about their love story. They talk about how they met. They went on a date at Soho House. They show, I mean, it feels like hundreds of intimate photos of them, you know, taking selfies in bed, snogging in photo booths. They show a picture of the night they got engaged. So I think that is quite amazing that we're seeing these sorts of pictures from people inside the royal family. There's also one quite funny story that I I wonder how it will go down. I found it quite amusing. 
one of their friends who appears on the on the documentary as a talking head reveals that they had a secret engagement party um, and all the guests wore animal onesies and Harry and Meghan wore matching penguin suits because penguins mate for life. So it was all a little bit cheesy, but I suppose quite sweet. Yeah, sort of knocked on the door of cringeworthy in the first episode, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not quite loudly on the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you describe the series as a series? Would you call it a, a good watch, a worthwhile watch? I think if you are interested in the royal family, if you've watched the drama, it's definitely worth a watch. I was very excited when I sat down this morning and was a little disappointed. It felt quite dry. It felt quite bland. Always fascinating to see hyper famous people and what they're doing, you know, behind closed doors, as it were. I'm wondering if volume two will give a little bit more. The way they've kind of lined it up is is explaining that the first three hours are their love story. It stops just before their wedding day. And then I'm thinking volume two will be much more interesting and much more shocking with with potentially a few more bombshells. It seems like there is such a split opinion among the public when it comes to Harry and Meghan. How do you think the public will respond to this series and the brand of Harry and Meghan? Do you think it could change some people's opinions? I think it might. I think every time you hear someone else's side of the story, you know, you you get to see it from their side. However, I I think if you like Harry and Meghan, you'll continue to like them. You'll say, see, this is what they had to go through. This is what was going on. No wonder they were miserable and had to leave. I think if you are kind of anti Harry and Meghan and don't really understand why they kind of keep harping on about all of this, you know, they're very privileged, live a lovely life. There's lots of terrible things going on in the world. There's more ammunition there to kind of be a bit negative about them. I think fundamentally nothing will change for them. They, I think what we see with them is kind of what what we get. And as I said earlier, I think it was the Oprah interview that was the real, real bombshell. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. This feels more of the same. And so it's going to make you think what what's next for them because post leaving the royal family, they've kind of centred their brand around, you know, speaking their truth about what's been going on. And they've done that now. We've heard it. What's next? There's more news, interviews and analysis in the Evening Standard newspaper and at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock.